everybody, good evening. Thank you. My name, for those that do not know, is Stuart Schlossman. S-C-H-L-O-S-S-M-A-N. You get all the emails from me, all right? So everybody in this room gets emails from me, and you do see my name on all those emails. So just take a look there. Before I get into any gibberish about tonight's program, I just want to thank those the companies that supported our program tonight. And I hope that you all appreciate it as well because without the support, the financial support that we get from the pharmaceutical industry, we could not possibly do these programs. And for tonight's program, we want to thank Sanofi Genzyme, Genentech, and Celgene. And I hope that you could all thank them. It would be greatly appreciated. They want you to learn from the programs that we provide. We are not providing programs about the medications. We are providing programs about all the other aspects about multiple sclerosis. This is what people need to learn. Next year, for instance, we're taking our show mainly on the road to what they call rural America. For those that don't understand what rural America is, 85% of the United States is considered rural. Okay, and in these rural areas, they do not have MS neurologists. And many times, people from rural regions need to travel two, three, four, five hours to go see an MS neurologist. Most of the time they can't leave though because they're disabled and they can't make those travels. So we're gonna be bringing our programs to these communities in various portions of the United States. We're setting up to do 30 or 40 of them next year. It is a lot. This year, by the way, we're on track to do 56 educational programs. And of the 56, I'm at 45 of them, all right? And this year already I've made 41 trips, all right? Next year is going to get more in detailed. We have two other people to get on the road with me that are going to get to these rural regions of West Virginia, of Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, Alabama. Everywhere there are people that have asked us to bring them the programs and where they feel they could get 20, 30, 40 people to attend these events. And that's what the world needs to see is that we're providing to those that are in underserved communities. So you may not realize it because you're getting a lot of educational programs from the pharmaceutical industry or patient advocacy organizations such, of our, such as ours that do come, but in those areas they're not getting anything, all right? And so we're getting, going to be getting to these areas. All right. That's it on this. We got a lot more to talk about with that, but I could talk to you separately if you like. I'm available after the program. Tonight's program, we have three speakers. We have Sherry Bins, Gail Lewis, and Stephen Newman. And I shouldn't say it like that. We have Sherry Bins. She's a nurse, and she's from Rhode Island. And then we have Dr. Gail Lewis, who's a psychologist from the Manhattan area. And we have what many of you will call your favorite, Dr. Stephen Newman. <laughs> all right, so first speaker. Oh, by the way, I'm going to ask you all, there's pads uh, on, the, on each of your tables and there are pens as well, and please write down whatever questions you might have, because all three are going to speak, and then at the very end, we're going to do a 35-minute Q&A. So if you could hold off on all your questions, again, food's going to be starting to be served in about 20 minutes. We're going to start with Sherry speaking, opening up the program, and then we're going to get into Dr. Lewis and then Dr. Newman, and then we will do a Q&A where I run around the room with a microphone. So let me tell you a little bit about Sherry. She's a multiple sclerosis nurse who has been living with MS for many years. She's on the advisory board for MS Views and News, is a regular presenter of programs for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation and the National MS Society, as well as support groups around the country. She was the recipient of the 2016 Professional Volunteer Shining Star Award from the National MS Society. Sherry is the co-chair of the Re research committee for a patient-powered research organization seeking to speed research in multiple sclerosis treatment. She's also an ambassador, peer reviewer, merit reviewer for the National Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And let's say hello to Sherry. Come on down. You know what you're speaking about, right? There you go. You're on your own. <laughs> he thinks he's a comic. Um, Stuart has given you sort of a formal in, um, introduction to me, but I'd like to tell you just very briefly about my journey with MS. Um, my first hospitalization 
was in 1975, but I wasn't diagnosed until 1994. Um, my ophthalmologist actually helped me to get my diagnosis. And I went back to the previous three primary care physicians I'd had over the previous 20 years and let them know that I had been diagnosed. And every one of them said, yeah, we figured it just didn't make sense to tell you when we thought we knew you had MS because at that time there was nothing to treat it. Now, thank goodness, we have many treatment options available, as well as lifestyle changes that we can make. Back when I was diagnosed, it was like, you know, you're having a flare, rest, don't do anything. Um, many of us quit our jobs when we were diagnosed, and I'm just so glad that we have moved beyond that point. So what I want to talk to you today about is how to recognize and manage MS relapses. When I was diagnosed, I had been in a, what I like to look at as a chronic relapse. One relapse kept hitting on top of another. It seemed like for about three years. And by, I, I told you I was diagnosed in 1994. By 2000, um, because I was, had been symptomatic for so long, um, nobody, offered to put me on any kind of medication because the medications were all tested on young people, on people who were newly diagnosed. And by the time I was scooter dependent in 2000, I was already approaching um, well into my 50s. So um, medication for many of the doctors was not an option for me until I found a new neurologist who looked at me and said, you know, you don't have a mild form of MS. Um, I, you, you've definitely transitioned to secondary progressive or maybe even your progressive relapsing because your central nervous system seems to be so active, uh, it really is like you're in the midst of a relapse. Have you had steroids? And I said, no. So he tried me on a course of steroids and two weeks later my neuro exam was significantly improved. So he said, you know, it may not help you, but we're going to put you on a medicine. And he told me what I was going to take. I wasn't given a choice. He just told me. And I would say after six months or so, things started to level off. And then after another six months, I started going downhill again. So I, I went on a uh, cruise for the MS foundation, they do an annual cruise every year uh, with high quality education while we're at sea. And it was life changing for me. I had been an RN for decades. And I had been a home care case manager. And I learned more on that one cruise about living healthy with MS than I had in my entire nursing career, including taking care of people who were homebound with MS. So I encourage you to learn what you can, when you can, and to use those bits of information to help improve your life. Um, we're also gonna talk after the relapse portion about how to communicate with your healthcare team, and then how to develop a healthcare team that's right for you individually. So let's start out first with pseudo-relapse or false relapse. Many of us think we're having a relapse, particularly after hot summers like what we've had right now. Um, heat, for many of us, can be really difficult to handle. And heat does kick up our MS symptoms in many cases. There's a syndrome called Euthoff's. And it's when your body gets overheated. If your core temperature, your internal temperature goes up as little as a, a quarter to a half a degree, in some people who are very sensitive to heat, it can bring on some of the MS symptoms that have quieted down. For me, I lose the vision in my left eye, or it gets very hazy. Um, I become very weak on the left side of my body. Um, fatigue is huge. I often can't empty my bladder when I get overheated, so I have to catheterize. So if you are getting overheated, 
please know that cooling yourself off can sometimes help those symptoms. Um, hydration is a big thing. Lots of cold intake. Uh, slushy is even better. You know, get that ice cream headache sort of thing with crushed ice or something that's going to rapidly cool you off interiorly. Um, how many of you have ever had the MS hug? All right, we've got a couple people here. I was in the emergency room one day in August about 11 years ago because I thought I was having a heart attack. My EKG was normal. Um, I was having trouble getting a full breath. I felt like there was an elephant sitting on my chest. And when I wasn't improving and there didn't seem to be any physical clue as to why I was having this, all of a sudden a light went on in my head and I thought, get me some really, really cold water. And I proceeded to down about a quart and a half of water in about 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, things started letting go. The hug relaxed. The pain in my chest disappeared. So we do have power over some of these things if we know what they are and what's going on. The other thing that can cause a pseudo relapse, a fake relapse, is an infection. Many of us get UTIs, and we may not even know we've got one. And again, if it raises our body temperature even a little, those symptoms can come back. So uh, trauma, you know, you're coming down the stairs and you misstep and all of a sudden the next morning you wake up and it's hard to move because your back hurts, your leg hurts, your hip hurts. You think that spasticity is kicking back in when it's just that little bit of a misstep. So there are a lot of things that can happen to us or can occur within our bodies that we have some control over. And if we have control over those things, then they're not considered relapses, even though they may make our MS symptoms flare at the moment. Whoop. All right, that, that was supposed to be there. This is me and David, my husband in the back, uh, last Father's Day at Six Flags. I think I may have showed this slide when we were in Melville last year. Um, I was pointing out the fact that I was well equipped to deal with the heat. I had my cooling vest and collar on. I had my support system. But you can tell from the look of my face, I am beet red. We got off that roller coaster and made our way to the first aid booth, and we were in the first aid booth for an hour and a half while the kids finished their rides. Um, I, I'm that heat sensitive, so um, heat really, you know, by the next day I was fine, and that's one way to know that you don't have a real relapse. If, if rest helps, if hydration helps, if cooling off helps, then it is a pseudo-relapse or considered a pseudo-relapse if your symptoms are flared again. A true relapse, however, is a resumption of your symptoms that have been under control or have disappeared for a while. Oftentimes, there'll be a new symptom that comes on with a, a new relapse. Those symptoms last for no less than 24 hours, and they're not relieved by rest, they're not relieved by cooling, they're not relieved by hydration, they're not relieved by taking a Tylenol. Um, the new symptoms are the one thing that I think probably take a lot of us to the doctor, but I think a lot of us will call the doctor too soon. They, we may call that doctor, like we, we woke up in the morning with, uh, if you're waking up in the morning with something new, then watch, because likely it's not related to heat, but it could re be related to an infection. So sort of take stock, take your temperature. If your temperature's up, think infection, don't think relapse and do what you can to get the temperature down and see if the symptoms aren't relieved. Um, so when, when do you call your doctor? Um, after that full day, so 24 hours after the symptoms have begun, please don't wait on a Friday afternoon until 4 o'clock to call the office. Um, call if, if your symptoms are 
solidifying and it really looks like you've got a relapse starting, um, then call as early in the day as you can. Uh, that may mean spending an entire day pretty miserable. Um, if you've got new paralysis, for example, three days ago you started with a numb foot, and then uh, two days ago the numbness went up to your knee, and this morning when you got up, you're kind of numb from the waist down, you get on the phone with that doctor right now. Don't wait until after lunch to see if it goes away. Um, loss of vision or pain in the eye is another reason to call the doctor after at least 24 hours. Um, a condition called optic neuritis is very common. About 90% of us with MS have had optic neuritis at one point or another. Um, oftentimes that is treated with steroids. But I can tell you, some of us don't always need steroids. We need to get off of our cell phones. We need to get off the computers. We need to get off the TV. We need to stop working our eyes so hard. It's really hard in today's society to give that advice, but frankly, the, the pain and the blurriness from optic neuritis can be helped by reducing that external stimuli. So how do we manage those relapses once we've determined that we really have one? Plenty of sleep. This, by the way, is my soon-to-be 41-year-old baby. <laughs> um, many of us with MS have trouble sleeping. Uh, it's, it's pretty common. Sleep hygiene is a big thing. We can talk more about that during question and answer if you have some questions about it. If you are a chronic poor sleeper, um, really work on reducing the stimuli in your environment. Fresh air, exercise, companionship, recreation. Recreation can be as simple as playing a game of cards or as David and I do over breakfast in the morning, a, a hand of backgammon. Uh, something that gives you joy, gets you thinking outside of the box. Learn to relax. Yoga is great for that. By the way, this is uh, me during my days of scooter use, walking my parents' dog. Um, really try to eat fresh. Try not to add preservatives or sugars or dyes or things like that to your food. The fresher the food, the better. The farm to table food, if you can get it, is really good. Um, just make sure that you're eating a nutritionally well-balanced diet. Keep, your, keep what's going into you as pure as possible during this time of stress on your body. Um, there are a number of medicinal ways to treat relapses. Um, sometimes we are given these medications because we ask or demand them. Other times our doctors will offer them because they see us coming to them to, in, in what can be an informative way and they feel like they need to solve a problem. So there are a couple of typical ways to treat relapses. One is with steroids. Many of you have had IV solumedrol. Um, more and more uh, people are talking now about getting oral prednisone for um, relapses. In Canada, they've used oral steroids for years while we were using the IV steroids. So there are a lot of doctors now, I'm, I'm hearing from people are giving 1,000 milligrams or 1,200 milligrams of prednisone mixed with liquid. Um, as a um, as a, a, a compounded medication, so they're drinking that every day throughout the day, or you're getting a handful of 50 prednisone pills to swallow. Um, I would take that with food, as it can be stomach upsetting, but it doesn't have it. It, it often doesn't have a lot of the severe side effects for people that are sensitive to steroids that the IV steroids do. So that may be a conversation you want to have with your doctor. <clears throat> Axar gel is another common treatment for people who don't tolerate the IV steroids well. It's another steroid. Um, in fact, 
It was what we used to use to treat people with MS decades ago before we started treating them with um, regular IV steroids. Axar is self-administered. Um, you give yourself five injections in a five-day period, so it can be taken at home. IVIV, IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulins is a blood product that is made from the antibodies of several different blood donors. And it is thought that these antibodies can help you fight off infection and things that are coming against your body that may be contributing to the relapse. So in people that don't tolerate steroids, some physicians are now suggesting that they try IVIG. Um, it doesn't work as rapidly as the steroids may work to reduce a relapse. But there have also been studies done over the years that have shown that the outcome in people who've been treated with these things versus those that have not is pretty even. However, if you're treated with the steroid medications, you run the risk of some other problems that you need to be aware of. <clears throat> I tell you this so that you don't, every time you get an episode of blurred vision or an episode of tingling that doesn't seem to go away, so that you're not asking for steroids every time, particularly if you're a woman. Um, I started on steroids a month before my 50th birthday. And I was already perimenopausal at that time, meaning that my hormones were beginning to ramp down. Those hormones have a protective effect on our bones, keeping them more dense. Steroids have a tendency to cause our bones to be weaker and to break. Two, two years after I stopped steroids, I'd been on steroids for 24 months. Two years after my last dose, I had a horrific fracture of my foot. There were more than 30 fractures in one foot. Um, and I've had several other fractures since then that have been small. So um, just be aware that that is a possibility. If you're on steroids for more than one or two rounds of it, I would talk to your doctor about whether or not they think you should be on calcium or, or increased D to help your bones strengthen. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other thing is that steroids can often raise your blood pressure, can often raise blood sugars, therefore um, making you a little bit more disposed to adult onset diabetes. It can cause fluid retention, and it can cause actual metabolic changes that cause you to gain weight. So they're not benign treatments. They're not a fix-all. So I just want to caution you to sort of weigh the odds and really listen to your doctor and what they have to say about whether or not in this specific instance they're warranted or not. <clears throat> so how do you talk to your healthcare team? It's a big question that I get asked often. You know you. Introduce yourself. Let them know what you feel that you need to be best supported. But this is one time when you don't want to be a storyteller. Bullet everything. Because your doctor or nurse does not have the time to listen to the backstory. They have time to listen to a list of what's going on right now. Um, and address what's happening right now if you can present it in five or ten minutes. So let them know if there are unpleasant side effects to any of your medications because it's very likely that the side effects can be managed. Something very, very simple as adding an extra glass of water a day can help knock down some of the side effects of your medicine. The dry mouth from the bladder control medications or the anti-spasm medications certainly can be helped by extra fluid. The steroids can be helped by extra fluid. Um, so be aware. Um, 
Let them know if the plan of care is burdensome. Maybe you're on a number of different medications, different doctors are giving them to you. Let them know what's hard about this and see if you can't problem solve together. Are there dietary or religious restrictions to what the plan of care being offered is? And the reason this has come to be is that back when we developed insulin for diabetes, it was developed from pork pancreases, from pig pancreas. And many of the patients that needed that type of medication did not consume pork products for religious purposes. So if there's anything at all that doesn't seem right to you, let your doctors know. I will tell you, though, that um, when you say, I want to treat this naturally, I don't want to treat it chemically, MS is not a condition that you say that about. There are ways to treat it naturally, to help things naturally, but naturally we have not found anything yet that calms the immune system as much as the drugs that, were, that we have approved to treat MS. Have your questions and concerns written out. I always print them out and take two copies, one for me and one for the doctor. So as we go down the list, I can take notes on my piece of paper and make sure that everything that I have a real concern for is answered. This is the type of thing I take to my doctor. Um, I do have this <clears throat> in a Word document, so if you want this to redo with your own information, just email me, I'll send it to you. Try not to bring more than two or three concerns to an appointment and not more than two or three questions to an appointment. If you've got more than that that you can't narrow into that category, then you need to make another appointment because it's not fair to either you or your doctor to cut things short. So the members of, of my healthcare team have been these persons at different times in my life. Um, obviously, my MS neurologist is at the top of the list. Primary care physician is really necessary. For, for some of us, that is an internist. For some, it can be a family practice doctor. For some people, it can be your gynecologist um, or a nurse practitioner or a PA. I go in about once a year for a physical therapy assessment, or what I like to call my annual tune-up. Um, I don't always notice that my gait is getting wonky. Um, I may notice that I'm having more pain in my hip. So somebody else's eyes often help. Um, a counselor or therapist is often very helpful because we're dealing with loss of function, grief issues, maybe loss of a job, family not understanding, and it's often good to have another person to bounce those things off of. Um, occupational therapists can help you learn how to do the things that you have to do during the day in a way that conserves energy. Um, I love my massage therapist. <laughs> Uh, really, I, I think there's more value um, with my visits with my massage therapist or my reflexologist than I get doing just about anything else. Uh, many people find acupuncture and chiropractic to be helpful as well. Now, <clears throat> this is a piece of artwork that my mother did. My father, was, when he retired, became a fine furniture carpenter from being a farmer. And mother was cleaning up the wood shop one day of scraps, and she found this piece of wood on the floor, and she saw something in it. So she got out some watercolors, and she highlighted it, and started looking at it, and wrote this poem. Like this old wood, my life shows stain of creeping flaws within the grain. Yet the creator looks and sees a thousand possibilities and brings forth beauty from disease. Like this old wood, beneath love's hand, I am transformed in ways not planned. And I want you to know that love doesn't have to come from others because you can't receive it unless it's coming from here first. So, your homework is to find something new to love about you so that your health can be improved 
and your life can be transformed. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Gail Lewis. And Dr. Gail Lewis is a psychologist and psychoanalyst in a private practice in New York. She received her postdoc training at the American Institute for Psychoanalysis of the Karen Horney Center in a certified multiple sclerosis and is a certified multiple sclerosis specialist and completed training for treating eating disorders, addictions, and compulsions at the William Allenson White Institute, where she's presently a member of the EDCAS steering committee and a guest faculty member. In addition, she's a program consultant for the organization Can Do MS and a partner in care for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society. In her practice, she specializes in the areas of eating disorders, multiple sclerosis, and trauma. Would you like to come on up? Anybody want to clap about the way I read? No. I didn't think so. <laughs> thank you. And thank you. I look forward to it. Good evening. So, I'm going to talk about the emotional aspects of living with MS for the individual with MS and the family unit around them. All right, so these are the goals for today that I'd like for us to accomplish. To identify the most common emotional struggles and mood issues in people with MS and their family unit, and to be able to identify treatment options for you. To be able to discuss basic facts about common emotional challenges, to having a diagnosis of and living with MS, and changes that arise as a result and then to be able to explain them to others once you learn them yourself. To recognize how emotional changes due to MS and its symptoms can in fact impact your relationships. And to identify and discuss ways to openly talk to your healthcare team about depression and anxiety and other emotional concerns you might have. So before I get into the nitty gritty of this, I want you to know that for me, for all of you, the most important thing to know is that having emotional reactions due to your MS, for whatever reasons, whether it's due to your diagnosis, whether it's due to the changes in symptoms, whether it's due to reactions of your family, whatever it is, it's perfectly normal and it's nothing to be ashamed of. And I'm saying that in an emphatic way because sometimes the issue of shame around some of these feelings that you're having can prevent you from talking to people that might be of help in having you deal with some of these emotions. So it's normal and these things can be helped. So these are some common emotional reactions to having a diagnosis of MS. There's shock. This can't be happening to me, this can't be happening to my wife, to my child. Denial, this isn't happening to me. Anger, why can't you fix what's happening to me? Anxiety, what's gonna happen next? Relief, at least I have a name for what's going on. Resentment, I have no control of what's gonna happen next. My person with MS feels like a burden to me. And another, another sentiment with this that is that someone with MS, their partner might say, my life has been taken away from me too. There's grieving. I've lost so much of my life. It feels like part of who I was died. And then there's depression. So we're gonna spend some time talking about depression and MS. People with MS and their partners and family members are at risk for having depression with an MS diagnosis present in that dynamic. And depression can affect all kinds of aspects of a relationship. It can affect the way you communicate, it can affect intimacy, it can affect the way you solve problems. And depression can be effectively managed, 
but it is underdiagnosed and undertreated. So why is that? Why is it underdiagnosed and undertreated if it can be treated effectively? These are some of the reasons. People with MS are not reporting that they have depression to the neurologist or to the nurse. And some of the reasons why is that they feel ashamed to have these feelings. I should be strong enough not to have that feeling. And that's your pride getting in the way. And pride can be a very strong feeling, but it interferes often with your ability to be able to ask for the help that you need. And depression sometimes can be so subtle that you can't really tell the difference between whether or not you have depression or this is just something continuing, a feeling state continuing from prior to your MS diagnosis. So you wouldn't know to talk about it. And doctors and medical staff are not asking adequate questions about emotional issues and about depression. And I'll talk more about that later. As a result, many people with MS are living with the difficulty of depression and living with emotional pain and are at higher risk for suicide. So more than 50% of people with MS will experience major depression. Depression can occur at any time over the disease course. And it may overlap or worsen other symptoms, such as cognitive difficulties and fatigue. And people are at greater risk for depression at major transition points. At the time of diagnosis, when you have a significant loss of function, when you have a loss of a job, I can add to that when there are significant marital problems that could lead to disruption in the marriage. And as I said in the previous slide, this can be very life-threatening. So MS ha with depression, it has multiple causes. It's neurologic, immunological, and psychosocial. So in terms of the brain pathology of depression, it's usually due to the location of a lesion in the prefrontal cortex. And that is depression that's caused literally from your MS. Um, and then there are psychosocial factors that could impact the level of depression that one might have. Uh, there's the unpredictability of the disease, which in my experience in my practice and working at NYU's medical centers and MS care center, this is the hardest factor of MS to live with, the unpredictability of the disease. There are psychosocial pressures, such as marital problems, economic pressures. There's emotion-centered coping style, which, how can I explain this? An emotion-centered coping style is basically moving in your life directed by your feelings versus directed by thoughts and facts. So let's just say you are depressed because of your MS. All of the movements that you make are a function of that depression. Um, and in turn, it becomes quite immobilizing. And moving forward and being mobilized is nearly impossible. But to work from a more knowledge-based and thoughtfully based way of functioning, you're using facts, you're using awareness of the things that you can do and the things that you can't do. And in working from that vantage point, thinking and knowing what you can do has the capacity to make you feel more empowered and more in control. And I, I suggest and emphasize, and I'm probably not the first person to tell you this, that anything that you can do to help you feel in control with a disease that takes away largely any feeling of control over our bodies, this is something that I encourage you to do. So then there's learned helplessness versus self-efficacy. And learned helplessness is an, an old theory um, that uses rats to try to stimulate getting food and then giving up. But in the human condition, in this situation, 
learned helplessness is you have a diagnosis of MS and you realize that there are things that you can't do and you get very depressed and you get very um, resigned to that and you stop trying. And that will feed your depression and will probably deepen your depression. But the alternative, one alternative at least, is taking a stance of self-advocacy. And this is about finding ways to feel empowered, uh, finding ways to use the information that you have, come to some kind of resolution about what you can't do, which I'm not suggesting is an easy thing to do at all. But come to some terms with that, but also build an arsenal of knowledge about what you can do for yourself, what can make you feel stronger, what can make you feel empowered, what can you ma make you feel mobilized in your life. And that will most definitely mitigate feelings of depression. So these are some tools for assessing depression. There's the Beck Depression Inventory, there's the Beck Fast Screen for Medically Ill Patients, and the Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression. And these are tools that can be administered by a neuropsychologist, amongst other tests that they could provide. And what I would recommend if any of you are interested in having some of these assessments is to find out from your MS care center if they have a neuropsychologist on staff or if they can refer you to somebody who can administer some of these. And another way to assess for depression is to have a psychiatric interview, which can be conducted by a mental health counselor, by a clinical social worker, by a psychologist such as myself, and by a psychiatrist. All right, let's turn to anxiety. All right, so anxiety is more common than depression, especially amongst females, particularly right after diagnosis. And it's the best predictor for excessive alcohol consumption for people with MS. The lifetime prevalence of generalized anxiety disorder in people with MS is found to be 18.6% versus 5.1% in the general population. That's almost four times the amount of generalized anxiety disorder in the MS population versus the general population. That's a pretty significant amount. And like depression, anxiety is underdiagnosed, underreported, and undertreated. But like depression, anxiety is something that responds very well to treatment. We also have mood changes and MS. So there are moderate to severe shifts in mood that commonly occur, not with everybody, but with a lot of people. Um, some of this may resonate for you. You may shift between happiness, sadness, irritability, and rage. You may not function as well cognitively. You may have difficulty taking care of yourselves and other people. You may lose time from work, and it may affect your self-esteem and sense of personal control. Now, I separated the next one because I, I think it's an important thing to note, but I don't want to alarm anybody. Um, some of these symptoms are precursors or symptoms actually of bipolar disorder. And there is a high correlation between a diagnosis of MS and having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. But I'm not suggesting that if you have any of these symptoms that I'm, I spoke of prior, that you have bipolar disorder. Um, but it is something if you're concerned about, if any of these resonate for you, if more than one of these resonate for you, it would be important to get an evaluation just to see because, again, this can be treated. So family members can also experience mood changes. And I'm sure you know what it's like when one of you is experiencing, say, a mood of sadness and the other one is experiencing a mood of rage. It becomes quite complicated in that situation for the two of you to communicate with each other, to hear each other, to even want to be near each other. So 
Um, mood disorders can be treated with a combination of psychotherapy and mood stabilizing medications in the family of anticonvulsants and antipsychotic medications combined with antidepressants. I know that sounds like very serious medication, but they can be very useful and something to discuss with a doctor. All right, so these are various emotional ways MS can impact your life, and some of them we've gone over. There's shock, denial, loss and grief, anxiety and depression, loneliness, fear, emotional and stress eating. There's a felt loss of control. Symptoms of disease and or medications, financial concerns, and external and internal chaos due to changes in family roles. So I want to talk about emotional and stress eating. And before I go to the next slide, I want to explain why I want to talk about this. Um, now, one of my specialties, as Stuart mentioned, is working with eating disorders. And I'm not suggesting that I'm bringing this up to diagnose any of you with having an eating disorder. But I found in my work, uh, both in my private practice and at NYU Medical Center and in my work at Can Do MS, that there are a lot of people with MS and their partners who use food as a way to deal with the variety of feelings that I've already mentioned. Um, and it's not necessarily a function of having MS, and I've researched and found no articles that speak to a significant correlation between having eating disorders and MS. But because there are so many medical concerns that are, that are significantly worrisome when people use food um, by either overeating or react against food by restricting, that can be quite problematic. Um, for the overeaters, there's concerns about obesity, cardiovascular issues, risks of diabetes. For people who are restrictors, um, there's concern about electrolyte imbalance, about osteoporosis, about, I don't need to go into all of that, but it's very challenging on the body when you already have an autoimmune disease that is very challenging on the body. So I just wanted to address this because I, I think that um, if I were to take a poll in the room, and I'm not going to do that, that many of you would raise your hand and say, yes, every now and again, I turn to food when I'm anxious, when I'm lonely, when I'm depressed, when I'm bored. So eating is one of the most emotionally charged experiences we have. And sometimes we eat for reasons other than physical hunger. And what I'm suggesting is that we eat for reasons of emotional hunger. And when is this a problem? When I'm lonely, when I'm bored, when I'm depressed. How often does it happen? When I'm lonely, when I'm bored, when I'm depressed. So these are some ways to perhaps respond differently to those emotional cues, such as being lonely, bored, and depressed, besides turning to food or turning away from food. Um, and this is something that I utilize in my practice, and uh, it's something that I think is not just about the way that you deal with food, but I think it could be very useful in any situation to slow things down so that you're not reactive and that you're thoughtful about what you're gonna do next. So take a breath. And when you take a breath, this makes space to think. And thinking mediates act of acting compulsively and it helps you address food mindfully. So I want you to cue into how you feel and why you think that eating X, Y, and Z, and I'm gonna say for this purpose, X, Y, and Z is a sleeve of Oreos. Um, I like eating Oreos. Okay, so how will eating a sleeve of Oreos help you address your feeling of anxiety, for example? So then you can ask yourself, has eating a sleeve of Oreos helped me before? And if so, for how long? 
Did the feeling come back pretty quickly after you ate the sleeve of Oreos? I would guess that the answers to that is, has it helped before? Probably for a few seconds. Um, and if so, I said, for how long? For a few seconds. And did the feeling come back? Did the anxiety come back after? Yes, probably it did. And it's probably accompanied by feeling guilty and feeling ashamed and feeling overly full and uncomfortable. So it's not necessarily the way to go. Um, maybe one Oreo. So you want to ask yourself if you're going to reach for the Oreos, Am I hungry enough to eat an apple? And if you're not, you're probably emotionally hungry and not physically hungry. Now, I'm, I'm not suggesting that these are easy things to do, because usually when you're in the state of grabbing the Oreos, you're not thinking, you're anxious, you're in this very agitated state. And being in that overwhelmed, agitated state makes it quite difficult to think and do these things I'm suggesting. This takes practice. So, as I said, practice paying attention to the difference between emotional and physical cues for hunger. And these are some resources to learn to more effectively deal with food and emotional eating. Speak to a dietitian, speak to a therapist, and you can learn cognitive techniques to help you. The ones that I suggested are some of them. These are other common mood issues in MS. Uh, there's the pseudobulbar affect, which I'll talk about some more. There's grieving, and I will address how depression is different from grieving. And in a recent study that was just done this year, um, it showed that people with MS who are beginning to experience cognitive difficulties are likely to have heightened perceptions of stress and consequently poorer sleep or more easily disrupted sleep and that this had a very big effect on their mood. So pseudobulbar affect, has anybody heard of this before? Okay. Um, actually, Danny Glover does a commercial um, and there are a few commercials now that are on TV about pseudobulbar affect. So it's characterized by uncontrolled laughing and crying that are inappropriate to the external and internal conditions of what's going on. And to someone that's with you, if you are laughing and crying excessively and uh, it doesn't quite make sense to the situation, it, it can be overwhelming to both of you. So it may be mediated by damage to the prefrontal cortex. It occurs in approximately 10% of people with MS. And one study shows that 46% of people with MS show signs that might be pseudobulbar affect. And it's generally associated with a longer disease course, greater disability, and more cognitive impairment. You're less likely to see this in someone who's recently diagnosed or who has relapsing or emitting MS. So what is normal grieving in MS? So grieving is, um, it's different from depression. Uh, and I was planning on reading all of that, but I don't need to do that. Um, in this situation with MS, grieving is addressing the loss, the losses that one feels from having a diagnosis of MS. The loss of the life that they had been living, the loss of the life that they had imagined, the loss of functions, of physical functions, of cognitive functions, and being in a state of feeling incredibly despairing about that. And this could be uh, a malignant kind of grieving that continues and that usually happens when someone is unable to come to terms with what we call a new normal. And that's, again, not an easy thing to do, but that can mitigate how intensely one is dealing with the grief of all of these issues. Depression is not as severe, um, but it's almost like a fog that is over you all the time. Um, 
and it is usually um, more characterological. It's not situationally based. It's usually something that is with you for a long time. Um, and depression rather than grief can be treated with medication effectively. Grief can be, but it's not shown to be as responsive to some of the antidepressant medications as depression is. But grief is very normal in the diagnosis of MS. So how should depression and anxiety be treated? Psychotherapy and antidepressant medication is the treatment of choice, but also there's the recommendation of exercise. And self-help and support groups. So these are not the same thing as psychotherapy, but they're ideal for sharing information, for sharing support and social activities. And it's an effective, an effective venue for learning coping skills, for learning things about how one is dealing with their MS, uh, management strategies, sharing tools and resources, and better for mild depression. Self-help and support groups is not an effective resource for major depressive disorder. So these are some facts about the efficacy of exercise on depression. And studies show that there's a decrease in depression and an increase in the quality of life with repeated aerobic training. And maybe some of you who are physically impaired who cannot do aerobic training in what you might think is aerobic training, there are a lot of modified ways that one can aerobically train. And there are exercise physiologists who specialize in MS who can help you uh, develop a course of activities that can be useful and attainable by you. Uh, with anxiety, it can decrease in a five to 10 minute single session. And the overall association with exercise is an increase in mood. So these are all really good things. What about non-traditional exercises, such as Tai Chi and yoga? Both of them have shown to decrease depression, decrease anxiety, and increase one's sense of feeling strong and one's mood in a really positive direction. So I have a few cartoons, I have three of them, and I just want you to read, if you can read what, what it's saying above, is something going on, you're so cranky and irritable lately, did I do something to upset you? I'm sure this sounds somewhat familiar to some of you. Then we have, you feel so far away all the time, are you tired or just tired of me? And the last is, you're so anxious all the time. We all have to tiptoe around you. Now, I recognize that these are statements, these are complaints, these are statements of stress, these are statements of frustration. Um, and while they might resonate for you and they might sound very negative, I'd like to have a constructive spin on it. My constructive spin is that at least there's communication. At least there is a statement of what is going on. And in my experience, when you keep these feelings inside, it just exacerbates already existing depression and anxiety. And it can be very toxic, both um, physically and emotionally. So. I think that if you're able to communicate these feelings with your partner, with your family member, with whomever is some support aspect of your life, then it, it, it takes away the intensity that you're holding all by yourself. You're then able to share it in a space with somebody else. And there's a good chance if the two of you, if it's a dyad, are willing to work at it, to be able to find some way to problem solve. Okay, I'm almost done. All right, and the last picture is about a child being sad. So a lot of people don't think kids should know about what's going on with someone's MS, and I disagree. 
And to be very quick, the MS Society has some really good resources on their website about how to talk to children about MS of all ages. And kids know what's going on. Kids pick up on everything. So it's better to put words to it, because otherwise they're going to feel crazy or they're going to feel like they've done something wrong. So the challenges to getting treatment, and I've, I've gone through all of this, but I just want to say that I don't want to blame doctors and nurses for not having the adequate skills or time to talk to their patients about depression. Uh, neurologists are typically dual board certified in neurology and psychiatry, so they're quite capable of asking these questions. But as you know, with managed care, you probably have 15 minutes for an appointment. And the neurologist is going to be focusing on neurological issues. They're going to be focusing on what's going on physically, what your symptoms are, how you're dealing with your medication, et cetera. And while they're quite capable of prescribing some of these medications we've discussed, it's my opinion that they shouldn't be doing that. It's my opinion you should be seeing a psychopharmacologist or a psychiatrist. So then your complaint is, I don't want to go to another doctor. I don't want to have another doctor's appointment. I get it. But they will have the time to talk to you about this. They can communicate with your neurology team, find out what's going on with your MS, and you can get more comprehensive care. That's just my opinion. All right, so call to action, talk to your healthcare providers. Talk to your support system. Be honest about how you're feeling. Try to find a way to step ahead of your shame because your shame will silence you. And it's important that you find a way to let people know what is going on because you can get the help. And as I said, depression and anxiety are highly treatable and there are medications and there are treatments such as therapy that can be very useful in combination with these medications. And these are some key takeaways. So mood changes are a part of the disease process. And normal grieving can be difficult to distinguish between depression and grieving. And depression and anxiety are more common in MS than in the general population. And as I said, anxiety and depression are underdiagnosed and undertreated. So you can make a difference in that. Speak up. Thank you. OK, so we're about to have our last presenter of the night. And again, you all know him. So it'd be hard to really describe what he has done for you other than his name being Dr. Stephen Newman. He's director of the Comprehensive MS Center at, the Island, at Island Neurologic, and he's active in multiple sclerosis research and trials. Let's welcome Dr. Newman. So thank you, Stuart, for asking me to come here and speak tonight. Uh, when Stuart first contacted me a number of months ago, he said, I'd like you to speak uh, to this group. I'd done something similar about a year ago uh, when I had a, a discussion with uh, Dr. Krieger, and we talked about different things happening in MS. I figured Stuart was going to ask me to talk about immunology, which is what my specialty is. But no, he asked me to speak about something that I really had to think about, how to set up a comprehensive MS team, uh, which is, I, I think is something extremely important. But the other thing that he really asked me to do was make my own slides. Now, I haven't made a slide in over 10 years. So as opposed to the beautifully made slides that you've seen before, this is going to be primitive. This is going to be on the level of a sixth grader. But you're going to hear me talk and speak about what I think is extremely important to all of you. So don't look at the slides. If you do, you might get sick. <laughs> so MS is an extremely, extremely complex disease. It involves, it involves multiple different systems. If you think about it, if you have another disease, it may just involve your stomach or your cardiovascular system uh, or your musculoskeletal system. 
But when your central nervous system is affected, your entire body becomes affected. And because of this, patients with MS have very, very special needs. When you really think about it, just about every organ system can be involved in MS, some more than other systems. Some of this was already brought out in the talk. Uh, when Gail spoke, she talked about emotional problems with MS, so it involves your emotions. It could also involve your bowel. It can involve your bladder. It can involve your musculoskeletal system. It could have indirect effects on your vascular system. So because of that, you need a very large team and you need a comprehensive team in order to adequately treat MS. The most important part of your team, though, is you. You are central to the team because everything that your doctor does or the team does will not work if you are not part of the team. You're somebody who has to be very, very engaged in your care because MS patients who are not engaged in their own care do not do very well. So if we look at different parts of the MS team, obviously the MS specialist is extremely important and it's my opinion that every MS patient should be taken care of at an MS center. Why is that? Well, if you go to a general neurologist, a general neurologist does everything. And they can't concentrate on the literature, they don't understand the research, and they really don't have the time to take care of the needs of MS, which are so complex and so many and so varied. So it, I feel that an MS patient should only be seen by an MS specialist. Uh, if you have really a bad cardiac condition, you're, you're going to see a cardiologist. But a general neurologist does many, many things, treats many different neurologic conditions, MS being one of these. As part of the MS team, your family is an extremely important part. The way you interact with your family, the way you interact with friends is extremely important, and that has to be part of your team. Other things that we talked about, uh, physical therapy, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, these are all part of the, machine, of the team, and other medical specialists. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each of these in a little bit of detail. So I think what you have to do first and foremost is be very, very honest with yourself. Many MS patients use denial, and this was brought out very, very nicely. If you deny your disease, you're not going to have adequate care. When you talk to your doctor, it's a partnership. When I put you on a medicine, you should be compliant with that medication. Many patients are not compliant. In the early days when we treated patients, we used uh, uh, injections. And there are many formulations of injections. Patients don't like sticking themselves. I had a patient who was not doing very well, and she was on an interferon. And I, I really didn't understand why she wasn't doing that well. And she said, you know, I get the injection, and I'd go in the bathroom to take it, and my mother would ask me if I took it, and I'd squirt it down the toilet. So the toilet got the benefit of the interferon, not the patient. So compliance and being honest with your doctor, once she finally leveled with me, and we actually, at that point, the pills came out, and I put her on an oral medication, her compliance was very, very good. So eventually, being honest with me helped the patient to do better. Following instructions is extremely important. Sometimes they're difficult. We sometimes ask patients to go for blood tests periodically. That's not fun. MRIs aren't fun. None of the tests we do are fun, but what they do is they give us a tremendous amount of information that helps us to make decisions in patient care. Your attitude is extremely, extremely important. And I think one of the things that was brought out is having a positive attitude is very important for all diseases. And a chronic disease that doesn't go away, your attitude is 
paramount to success in treatment. If you have a good attitude, you're more likely to do better with the same treatment than somebody who has a poor attitude. So family and friends are extremely important. Why is that? Well, they could look at you and see things that you don't see. I've said this in some of my other talks, but very often a patient will come into my office and they'll have a family member, which I think is important, and I'll say, how do you feel? How are you doing? And they say, I'm doing wonderful, doc. I'm feeling great. And the spouse looks over and says, no, you're not. You're doing lousy. You're not walking. You're complaining about pain all the time. You're complaining about stiffness. It's important to have somebody else with you. And that somebody who's in your family is part of this healthcare team. Your children are part of the healthcare team. MS is a family disease. Patients who have MS are the ones who, are suff who suffer from the disease, but your family also suffers from the disease in a very different way. They have to learn how to deal with some of the disabilities that you have. As depressing and anxious as you are, family members often feel the same way. They don't express it. Family members uh, are paramount to actual uh, improvement in, in patients. So I always want a family member to come in. I, I think family members are extremely important. And when patients come in alone, I think we're getting only half the story. Now many of my patients here and people here who I see, they often do bring a family member. And that family member is extremely important in helping me to make a decision with the patient. One of the things that was brought out is that we now have many different disease modifying agents. Uh, when I first went into practice, uh, and you're not going to believe this, over 42 years ago, we had absolutely nothing. When somebody had an attack, we'd give them ACTH. It wasn't called Acthar then, it was called ACTH gel, and this was brought out by uh, Sherry. That's all we could do. We could observe, we could commiserate, but we couldn't adequately treat. Now we have 14 different medications, and in the next year, several more are going to be coming out. So we have different choices, and these choices are choices that we have to make together. I may want to put you on a medication. I may want to say, well, I think you'll do well on this injectable. If you say, there's no way in hell I'm going to inject myself, I'm not going to use this because I do have other choices. Some medications have specific side effects that may not be good for you. We have to speak ab about those side effects versus beneficial effects and see whether you will benefit from this. Patients with MS have many different symptoms, spasticity, bladder problems. All of the meds have side effects. So we have to make a decision together whether the medications, uh, the side effects of the medications are worse than the symptoms you're getting from your disease. So collaboration is very important. One of the things that was brought out is, I tell you what disease modifying agent I think you'll do well on. But if you don't want to do it, you've got to communicate with me. It's my job as a doctor to see you as a patient but the, and make suggestions. That's what I've gone to school for. That's what I read about. But we still have to come together when the final decision is made. So one of the things I mentioned before is that an MS center is where MS patients should be treated. And the center should have many, many different things. One of the things that I think is extremely important is that it's got to be accessible. I can't have an MS center and have you walk up steps to get to my office. So you have to have a ramp to get in. We have to have handicapped bathrooms in our office. We also should have an office staff that understands MS patients. The office staff can't be grumpy because the office staff is what you see first that represents me. And if your office staff is curt, if they're grumpy, if they're snippy, you're not going to be real happy to come back and see me. And with all of the problems that MS patients have, the first people you see are extremely important. So I, I try to train my office staff uh, to really be nice, to be courteous, uh, 
and to try to be understanding of the needs that MS patients have. What's also very important is your office staff has to be able to help with ancillary things, such as insurance. Regular neurology offices may not understand how to use uh, or how to deal with different insurance companies with different disease-modifying treatments. I have a woman who is dedicated to doing this, and she's really dedicated. Her name is Roz, and she is super. I don't understand the insurances as well as she does, and whenever there's a question, she speaks to the patients, she tells them what they can do, what they can't do, she makes it easier for them to get insured. When I diagnose you and I want to put you on treatment, you want to get that treatment as fast as possible. And if your staff is not able to get this going fast enough, it makes you more anxious because it delays treatment. So I think that's extremely important. Our nursing staff is also very, very important. We have to have nurses who understand patients. What we have in our office are nurses that know my patients extremely well. They, I have an infusion center, which we'll talk about in a little while, but these infusion nurses actually act as therapists very often because when you're sitting in the infusion suite and you're getting treatment, you're actually talking to nurses and you're talking to other patients at the same time. It's almost a self-help group. And what we see in some medications that are given monthly is that patients want to go back with the same people every single month because you see you're not alone. These are other people who have the same disease as you. These are other people who are being treated the same way as you. And you could share stories together. Some patients on a medication uh, that we give monthly, when they, uh, right, before they're able, right before they're supposed to get their medication, they sort of slump down. They know they, they need their medicine. They say, what am I, crazy? But the patient next in the next chair has the same same thing. So they say, I'm not alone, I'm not crazy. This is what other people who have MS have. So this is extremely important. I have an infusion center and I've had it for many, many years because we do a lot of infusible medications. But as part of the team, the infusion center in your office is extremely important. If you go to a general neurologist and they want to infuse you with something, they have to send you outside. Also, if a patient comes in to me and I see they're relapsing, I send them over to the infusion center, which is right in my office immediately. We're able to treat these people almost as soon as they come in and they become symptomatic. I happen to be a fan of IV steroids. I've tried PO steroids with many patients and they don't like it. And one of the reasons they don't like it is because they feel when they come into the infusion center, they're being taken care of. I'm here now, I'm here doctor. If I have any problems, you're right there in the next office and you could come and you could help me out. So I think it gives patients a uh, better feeling of well-being. It's extremely important to be able to do that, to have these services, and that is part of my MS team. And my infusion nurses, by the way, have been with me for a long time. They know all of my patients. They could counsel my patients. And if anything is going on that, they're not, that my patients aren't telling me, my infusion nurse comes in and she uh, tattletales, which I think is good, and I often have walk over to the infusion center to answer that question or to take care of that patient's need at that time. One of the other things that we have is research. And in part of my team is a research team. We're involved in multiple different research projects. And what's important in this is that we're at the cutting edge and we understand things that are happening or will be happening in MS before they're FDA approved. I think this gives patients confidence, knowing that their doctor is really at the cutting edge, knows all the new things that are coming out, and knows what's coming on down the line that could help them even more. I constantly get questions about stem cells, about remyelination, and all of these things are in the works. But if you're not really engaged in MS, and you're not really engaged in research, you may not be able to answer those questions. And that's why, again, an MS specialist in an MS center is extremely important. Also, having research gives 
patients the ability to get on p possible medications uh, if they're doing bad. Most research now in America is not placebo controlled. So it's a new medicine versus a medicine on the market. So everybody is always treated, but you have the option of being treated with something older that we know about versus something newer that may help you even more. So that gives us one more thing that we could do for the MS patient. Physical therapy should be part of the MS team, and that includes occupational therapy. A large percentage of my patients need this. I, I think it's extremely important to exercise, because what exercise and PT does is, it stimulates the release of endorphins, of enkephalins and growth factors, and that helps you to feel better. Even if it's not affecting you physically, it's helping you mentally. Many MS patients who don't have any sort of activity or therapy get much worse. And they get much worse simply because they're not moving around. Even passive range of motion is important for many of my patients who are wheelchair bound. The more you do, the better you're going to do. We talked about, and Gail brought this out very, very nicely. When I say social work, I mean therapy, psychiatric social work, psychiatrists, psychologists. I'm not going to go into this in any more detail because this was already talked about, but that has to be part of a comprehensive MS team because of all the problems that MS patients have, living with a chronic disease, but also having damage to certain areas of the brain that may affect depression and anxiety. One of the things that is part of my team, and these are people that I deal with, you have to have a dedicated urologist. And the urologist has to be somebody who has an interest in MS. The vast majority of neurologists, of urologists rather, care more about lopping out prostates and doing things like that than taking care of people with neurogenic bladders. So you have to have somebody who understands the MS bladder and has an interest in it. I work with a person uh, who really has an interest, and that person is part of my team. Most regular urologists will not use Botox or some of the newer therapies or understand the balance of bladder treatment. There are certain bladder medications that we use to relax the bladder. There are certain ones that we use to make the bladder contract better. And there are certain medicines that we use to affect the way the bladder neck works. In order to use these medications properly, proper testing has to be done. And the only way that's going to happen is if you go to somebody who understands the proper testing so the proper medications can be used. And if they're not working, where to go next? So this is extremely important. MS patients who have neurogenic bladders usually are up all night. They're not sleeping, and when, not, when they're not sleeping, they're more drowsy during the day. And the more drowsy you are, the worse you're going to be. The other thing that's important about your bladder and sleep at the same time is that when you sleep is when your brain starts to energize. You know, sleep is an extremely, extremely important science, but we now know that during sleep, your brain gets rid of, gets rid of waste products. There is a pumping system within, we call it the interstitial tissue, that gets out the waste. And at the same time, energy starts to be renewed. If you're not sleeping, you're not re-energizing your brain. If you're not re-energizing your brain, your memory will not be as good. Your function the next day will not be as good. We even know that your immune system doesn't work quite as well. And one of the prime reasons why people with MS don't sleep is because their bladders don't let them sleep. The other thing we see, and you have to work with a gastroenterologist who's part of the uh, team, is because the vast majority of MS patients are constipated. Some have diarrhea, but the vast majority are, and one of the reasons is that they don't drink enough during the day, and they don't drink enough because they're scared their bladders aren't going to work. So we have to have a cooperation of many, many different specialties which can affect all of the different organ systems that are affected by MS. We also want to have the proper diet, and much of the diet also affects the way your bowel works, and it also affects your well-being. So we sometimes can use a dietitian, but what 
I usually tell my patients is to have a high fiber, low fat diet, green leafy vegetables, and if that doesn't work, I'll send them to a dietitian because your diet often affects the way you function the next day and it affects the way your immune system works also. Your family doctor or internist is extremely important. They're the first line. They're going to see you for your global medical problems, but if you don't have a good, if the neurologist doesn't have a good relationship with the family doctor, many different things can be missed. You may have a subclinical urinary tract infection. The first person you're going to see if you're not feeling well may be your family doctor. If he can't pick that up and call you and have a consultation, that's going to get worse. And as Sherry said, urinary tract infections are basically one of the things that cause false or pseudo exacerbations. It, it's interesting what you spoke about with pseudo attacks. Your brain has something called plasticity, meaning when one area doesn't work, another area takes over. Well, when your brain is stressed, when your nervous system is stressed, infection is probably the most common thing that does it, but emotional stress will do it, lack of sleep will do it, sedative hypnotic medications will do it. Many, many different things can affect the brain plasticity, and when that happens, areas that are compensating for damage stop compensating. She mentioned the Udhoff effect, and that's heat affecting it, but many different things can affect the way your brain works, and as we get older, these things get worse. Pseudo relapses become greater, and the reason for this is that we lose brain cells. So we lose the ability to compensate more as we get older. It's important to be aware of that. So what I'm going to end with is that all MS patients, in my opinion, need an MS center. And that MS center has to be comprehensive. It has to be take care, it has to take care of all of your needs. And all decisions that we make are decisions between you and me. Not just me dictating, but you have to feedback because at the end of the day, you're the person taking the medication, you're the person who may be getting side effects, so we have to have that interaction. So I'm gonna end with that and I think we're now gonna have a question and answer period. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> By the way, your slides were fantastic. They were very easy to read, they were clear, and I have to thank you for that. <laughs> Great. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna have Dr. Lewis, and we're gonna have Sherry Benz, and we're gonna have Dr. Newman all up here at the same time, and I'm gonna run around the room. I need you to raise your hand. Let me acknowledge that you have a question, and I'll get back to you. Just know that it's only me running around the room, all right? So I don't care if you have me run back and forth for an hour, but just show me up, put your hand up, let me know you have a question, and then we'll just take it from there, and I'll just get around the room to see you. The two in the back, I'll be right back to you. I'm going here first. By the way, call out who you want, and I'm only holding, it's only me holding the mic. Saves on germs. It's only me Sorry. holding the mic. Okay. <laughs> Hi, it's Melissa. And my question is, uh, Dr. Newman, you had mentioned that um, when you go to see you with a family member, and you, Dr. Newman, is saying that, um, how do you, <laughs> that um, you ask me how I'm feeling, and I respond by telling you that yes, everything is just fine. My family member is telling me, absolutely not. Why are you not saying X, Y, and Z? Why are you going to accept what they are saying than what I am saying? Because they may be seeing something that I, what if I didn't want to talk to you that day? What if I wanted to have an ar argue with you all month long? I mean, it, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, I should have credence over what they're, they're about to tell you, something different than what I'm feeling. That's a really a good question. It's up to me to decide who I want to believe. <laughs> if you say, that, if I ask you, gee, are you having problems with your walking? And you say, no, I'm walking fine. And then I examine you and you're not walking fine. Then I'm going to believe the family member. I think it's always important to have several heads together. Uh, a lot of this often has to do with how you're responding, how your memory is, how your emotions are. Because okay, it's more, more so is what I'm talking about, emotions rather than physically falling down. Anybody can see that. A but my emotions this. is what I'm saying, is that I may be very emotional to what my, my kids who are teens drive you absolutely nuts. So 
whatever they throw at me, I'm going to carry. Sure. I don't know how to deflect it. But what they're seeing is that I'm constantly um, crying, I'm emotional, and that they can't take me anyplace. Well, it's something that I'm going to store here and then decide what to make a decision. I may not act on it right away, but it's something that is giving me another view, another outlook on how you're doing. And that's going to be stored right here. And then I may eventually make a decision. I may not make it that day. But it's, the more data I get, the better the more information I'm going to have to treat you. Before we get to the next question, I just want to let everybody know, we need you to ask general questions and not about yourselves, because if he's your doctor, he can't speak about your medical condition in front of everybody. And if he's not your doctor, either one of them not being your doctor, they are not allowed to answer you as if they were your doctor. So just ask a general question that, what if a person is driving somebody crazy? Whatever. But it's no, it can't be about you. Yeah, hi, this question's for Dr. Newman. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll ask you what if. Uh, I have a couple autoimmune diseases. What if? I was offered... What if? Can myasthenia gravis and, and MS, those are the autoimmune diseases. I have a, there's an MS doctor that, that says that the myasthenia gravis medication can work as a cure for the MS, and that's what I wanted to get your opinion on, on that specifically. Uh, th this is a general question, and some myasthenia gravis uh, medications can't work for MS. Um, I'm, I'm not going to talk about which ones at this point, and am I allowed to do that? Yes, yeah, some people use rituxan or ocrelizumab to uh, treat both. Uh, myasthenia is a B cell disorder, and as you're depleting B cells, you reduce the autoantibodies that we're seeing. We are also are now using this in MS. B cell depletion is one of the things that came out about a year ago, and we're now seeing that B cells play a major, major role in MS. So if he wants to uh, you know, uh, kill two birds with one stone, so to say, it's giving you one medicine rather than two medicines and two side effects. All right, well, the medication is Celsept. And Celsept, I don't know, you know, as far as it goes, I've, I've spoken to people that said for MS, it's not generally uh, the medicine that you would use, but they, they did that because they wanted to close my immune system down. Celsept is used in uh, myasthenia. We don't use it a lot in MS. Have we used it in the past? In rare instances, yes. But there are other medicines, at least, that I would use first. Next question, and as I get back to the back side of the room, I'm going to stop here first. Um, there were many references made to the possibility of an MS patient being on antidepressants. Have there been any studies done um, about any interference from an antidepressant with the MS medication itself? Not that I'm aware of. Um, but if that is something that's of concern to you, um, and the psychiatrist or psychopharmacologist is not part of your MS care team, then it would be very useful to have uh, consent signed for your psychi psychiatrist to be able to speak to your neurologist or speak to somebody at the MS care center to understand what medication you're taking and what what interferences might might happen as a result of the medication of choice for the depression there are many antidepressants that are available so um, given that antidepressants are very commonly provided to people with MS on a variety of DMTs there's bound to be at least one medication that will not cause any, any interference with your MS medication. Does that answer your question? Okay. One of the things that um, I picked up on early on when interferons came out was in the clinical trials, they look at a number of symptoms that are reported by people. And actually, with the interferons that are out, 
Um, people that were on a placebo at that time or something that was not an active medication actually had higher levels of depression reported by one or two percent than people who were on the interferon. So it may well be uh, related to the disease. It could also be caused some by the side effects, which as I said, could be helped by um, hydrating better. So um, there are a number of factors in that. But if you look at the clinical trial data, people that are on placebos were actually having a little bit higher rates of reported depression than those who were on the interferon. Did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, in, in terms of when we do clinical trials also, if somebody says they're depressed, it has to go in as an adverse event. But when we look at different medications, what we look at is the percentage of patients who had this adverse event in the drug as compared to placebo. And if it's in, say the adverse event was in more than 10% of the population, if it's greater in drug than placebo, then it may be something you know that we have to worry about. If it's only in a very tiny percentage of people, it may not have anything to do with the medication itself. Now the other thing you look at is, are any of the drugs, when they're metabolized, affecting an antidepressant? And we haven't seen that at all. Next question's over here. Um, Nurse Sherry mentioned acupuncture. Um, I have friends that say acupuncture helps them with muscle pains and whatever, and I've heard that conflicting uh, issues with acupuncture and MS patients because it interferes with nerve pathways, and I was wondering if that's I think it's an individual thing. Um, studies have been done by the MS Society looking at people that report an improvement with acupuncture or chiropractic or any number of things like that. And about half of us respond positively and half not so positively. Um, I've tried it myself on three separate occasions for like six different sessions, and every time, by the time we got to the sixth or seventh session, I was getting worse. They tell me if I'd completed the eight sessions, I would have been better, but I don't know that. I wasn't going to submit myself to that. I have three different questions, so I'll start with one. Dr. Newman, you were talking a lot about a specialized, comprehensive MS center. We do programs around the country. And in many of these areas, there does not exist a comprehensive MS center, nor does there exist a doctor who specializes in MS. What do you suggest? If you're in an area of the country where there isn't a center, and it was brought out that 85% people live in rural areas, that neurologist has to be able to consult with an MS specialist. And that neurologist has to then ask the appropriate questions uh, to help patients uh, do better. So that patient may go to the MS center once a year, so the MS doctor knows the patient. The rest of the time will be seen by the rural doctor who consults with the MS specialist. And that's what we see. The other thing that's coming out now, we're seeing more and more, is, telemedic is telemedicine, where people from MS centers will actually be able to interface with the MS patients in terms of their symptoms, asking questions, and if there are things on examination, then they talk to the uh, treating doctor who is in that rural area. So you're suggesting that people actually have two neurologists? If they live in a rural area and if they have MS, I think it's a better idea because, again, that rural neurologist may not have great knowledge about MS. But if the MS doctor also knows that patient, they could consult. The patient doesn't have to go there every three months or every six months. But if they make the trip once a year and then they see their, the, the doctor, the treating doctor, you could have continuation of care that way. Okay, my second question, Dr. Newman, was you said that um, when a patient comes to you, you recommend a particular medication with consultation with that patient. How do you decide what you're going to recommend? When I, our, our, our medicines have different mechanisms of action. Some medicines are highly effective, some are less effective. When I see somebody with MS, I know by their MRI, 
by their course, by their examination, by their age, what I think would be the most appropriate medication for that person. That's based on what we see in clinical trials and what our clinical experience is. So you're coming to me for an opinion. And if you're coming to me, either take my opinion or don't, but if you're coming to an MS doctor and we give you an opinion, it's something that we've really thought about. We're just not pulling it out of the air. Now you may say, Doc, you know, you may think it's the best medicine, but I'm scared of this side effect. I'm going to talk to you about that, and if you don't want to take it, I always have other alternatives. I have a first, a second, and a third choice. But it has to be an interaction, and it's my job based upon my experience and the reading I do and the many MS patients I take care of what I think would work best with you. Are there any biomarkers available now, like a blood test that's going to tell you what the best medication is for a particular person? No, there are no biomarkers, but in the future there will be uh, markers that will help us pick up what an exacerbation is very, very early on, how patients are doing. We call this neurofilament light, and there's going to be a blood test probably in the next year uh, where we're going to be able to pick up this protein, which is a result of breakdown of neuronal cells. That's in the future, but there's no biomarker like we see in oncology, where you have this biomarker, this oncologic medicine will work better. We don't have that in MS. Hi, Dr. Newman. So, um, so about 25 years ago, we had no medications. Today we have 15, you said, 14? 14. So uh, what's, what's the future look like? What's coming up next year? How, how much better are they than what we have today? And will there ever be a cure? Uh, I, I, okay, so to answer your question, probably within the next year, there's going to be uh, one, maybe two more medications. One may be uh, FDA approved for secondary progressive MS. Another is an oral medication, uh, Mavenclad, we think will be out probably sometime next year, which is a pill that you take a few times, almost like Lemtrada, which is infusible, and you don't have to take it anymore. Uh, there's going to be another B-cell depleter uh, that's going to be given uh, rather than IV. It's going to be given monthly, which you'll be able to give it yourself subcutaneously. All of these are good medications. Are they better than what we have now? Time will tell, because you have to look at a medicine longitudinally over a long period of time to see how good this medication really is. When a new medication comes out, we've looked at it in a clinical trial. Most clinical trials are two years. Then we have an extension. We really don't know how it's going to do until this medication is out for a number of years and we could see some of the problems with the medication that we haven't seen in a short clinical trial. In terms of cure, we have to be able to diagnose it before people get it in order to cure people. We could slow it down, though, considerably. Yes? Wait. Before we go to her, I'm going to have a question for Sherry and then I have one for Dr. Lewis. All right. Firstly, are there any uh, treatment, are there any research centers that you can tell us about, about what they're doing to collect data on research? There are a number of patient-powered research networks around the country for various diseases. There is one specifically for MS. It's called I Conquer MS, and it's the brainchild of the Accelerated Cure Project, which is a not-for-profit. Um, we gather information from our members. We ask you to fill out surveys about the course of your MS, about the drugs you're taking, why you went off of them, what the side effects were, what your worst symptoms are. There is some information right outside this door on I Conquer MS. There's also a sign-up sheet if you want to go on their mailing list. Um, there's a $50 Amazon gift card in it for some. <laughs> Uh, and also, uh, there's contact information for me if you have more questions about that. Great. And Dr. Lewis, if, you, if a patient comes to you that is displaying a lot of the uh, symptoms of MS but was never diagnosed with MS, if you could see PBA in that person or if you could see severe depression in that person and other symptoms that 
could mean that the person might have multiple sclerosis. Do you refer them off to an MS neurologist? Most definitely. I would refer them to, and I'm lucky, I live in New York City. There are several comprehensive MS care centers in New York, so I would definitely refer them to a neurologist who specializes in MS. Great. And for all of you, um, Family members often get multiple sclerosis as well, children or children have it and then it's known that a sibling has it. Can you tell you know, everybody how that might be uh, seen you know, based on what's going on with symptom, symptomatic or whatnot? I think one of the beauties about living in a family unit where somebody has a chronic illness is that empathy is created, understanding is created as people talk about it. So if there's a symptom that shows up in a sibling or a child or a grandchild that triggers some concern, um, I think sometimes the chase can be cut to right away. Um, whether or not that's something that is in the picture or whether it's uh, a worry that's acting itself out physically. It's, it's a major concern that many parents have re regarding children. Uh, and I get this question all the time. And what, what my answer is, if they have symptoms, I'm going to send them for an MRI scan. I think it reduces worry, it reduces emotional stress if that MRI is negative. If it's positive, then we've gotten the diagnosis early, and the earlier you treat, the better patients do. So either way, it's something that we could look at quite easily. I think in the future, we'll be able to screen even better when neurofilament light comes, on, uh, comes out, because it'll be a simple blood test. You're not going to have to send somebody for imaging. And if we see a signal there, then we can follow it up with MRI. And this is what we're going to be seeing once this test comes out down the line. Using this to even predict relapses, depending upon how often we're doing, uh, where, how, how often that test is being done. So the way we treat MS is going to be changed through technology, and the way we look for different predictors of what's going to happen will be changed with technology. Okay, I am also one of those patients with more than one autoimmune situation. My first is the MS, the second was autoimmune hepatitis, which has given me a cirrhotic liver. Will there ever be a medication, an oral medication in the pipeline, because I have no choices? A medication that is not affect, that will not affect liver. Exactly. Well, Copaxone does not affect your I liver. I know. Will there ever be an oral medication, or oral, is there anything in the pop? In not the out at this point. Okay, thank None. you. Next one. Yes. Hi, I have a couple of questions. First one is very simple. What's the difference between D2 and D3 as far as What's that? Vitamin, D. D, vitamin D and vitamin D2 and vitamin and, 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 and D3? Okay, yeah. Vitamin D is extremely important. The active metabolite is three. Okay, so if you're taking D3, you're taking in what your body needs. Okay. So D2, why do doctors prescribe D2? D2 as a, is, is metabolized to D3. So they're the same thing? It'll eventually end up being the same thing, correct. Okay, great. And then you, I think you had spoken about um, having a team, like a, a, a physical therapist, a... You know, a regular do doctor and a neurologist or an MS doctor. Do you guys all, I have a problem with no one wants to speak to each other. And is that normal? Uh, like, it, it does happen. But yeah, I, so how do, you, how do you have a team who just does not, We send you know, notes to each other. Because I'll get medicine from some, ber some person, and one doctor, and then get medicine from a different doctor, sure. and then the next thing I know, I'm, I'm on four different medications, and they're all like, who put you on that medication, and who put you on that medication, and it just doesn't pan up. You should all speak to each other. We try to do that through different notes that we fax. 
uh, whenever I see a patient, I fax a note to the referring physician. Okay. When my when the, the urologist sees one of my patients, they fax a note to me. So if it has to do with their MS and something that's involving their MS, I get notes from all of these different specialties. Physical therapy, this therapist sends me notes. If I have somebody who I'm seeing who has a GI problem, gastroenterologist. So that's how we communicate. And often if we don't get a note, pick up the phone. And you guys will speak to each other. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned and also was mentioned by this gentleman over here, you are the head of your healthcare team. Right. It is incumbent upon you to generate those communications to the various members of your healthcare team. I saw Dr. Newman today, and he's ordered this lab work. Keep an eye out for it. I've asked that you be copied on it. You are the head of your healthcare team. Okay. Can I add to that? Um, uh, these days, which I, I think, in addition to you being the per your spokesperson for yourself, uh, many medical offices and hospitals have ways now to communicate through their computer systems about what's going on. Uh, and this could be hospitals that are unaffiliated, uh, doctors who are unaffiliated, where you can sign a consent and they can access files from each of your doctors, even if there's no actual communication between them, so that there's awareness as to what medications that you're on. And you can find out if your doctor does that. One other thing, and to Dr. Lewis's point, Whenever I see a patient, I always ask, is there a change in medication? And it's one of the first questions we ask. And if I'm not sure of what's going on, then we communicate. But that's one of my first questions. And that's one of the questions that our girls ask outside. Have you had a change in medication? Right. So it's, it's I guess, time consuming for you guys to speak to another doctor to find out well, if you've had a change in medication and you know what that change is and you tell me what it is, I write that down. If I think that there could be a problem with something, I'm going to address the problem. But usually the med will involve one of your other systems. And one more question. Oh, you already had ten. I had two. <laughs> I hold it. Okay, and the last question I have is bipolar disease, it's not just MS related, obviously. So how do you tell whether someone's depressed via MS or via just regular, you know, it, it is what it is? I get that question a lot. Is my, is this symptom a function of my MS? Is it a function of something else going on in my life? And I often ask the question, which might sound obnoxious, does it really matter? And the truth is it does matter to people. So I've stopped asking that question. I, I, don't, I don't know that there is a way to differentiate between the symptoms of MS-related depression versus depression that you might have from something else, unless if you had depression pre-morbid to your MS diagnosis and your depression symptoms or affect have changed as a result of your MS diagnosis, then you can say that your MS has affected the expression of your depression. I think there's a lot of agreement about vitamin D3. Most, there seems to be a lot of people that recommend it for those of us with MS. What about the children and grandchildren of those people with vitamin D? Is there any um, way to communicate or do you communicate with pediatricians and let them know how important vitamin D is for even young children? The American Pediatric Society has set standards for children with vitamin D. 
Um, they also have recognized that when there is a parent with an autoimmune disorder, that they need to increase the amount of D. Um, my grandchildren, when they were born, were told by their pediatrician that since I have MS, they wanted the children on 800 units a day instead of the recommended two to 400. Oh yeah, there's lots of pediatricians like that. Here. Yeah, Dr. Lewis, um, can uh, MS people be treated for bipolar and do Most you, definitely. And do you have a successful uh, treatment for that? Uh, well, yes, I would refer that person to a psychiatrist. And as I mentioned, there are mood stabilizing medications. The most damaging thing that one person can do, and this is why I think it's important to go to a psychiatrist or a psychopharmacologist, not to belittle neurologists in any way, um, is that often antidepressants are given to people who have mood disorders. And if, in fact, you have bipolar disorder, what doing giving an antidepressant to them will do will increase any kind of manic stuff that's going on. So you want to have an antidepressant and a mood stabilizing medication. And a psychiatrist is best at assessing for that. And those medications are very useful in treating and, and in, in really trying to bring down the intensity of either the depression or the mania, and, and actually both. Okay. Do you see a lot of patients with MS with bipolar? Um, I do, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I, um, aside from having a rest, is there anything that can be done for fatigue? Because I have fatigue virtually all the time. Fatigue is pretty complex. Um, part of fatigue can be a result of not getting a good night's sleep. Um, a lot of fatigue can be a result of getting up two, three, four times a night to use the bathroom. Can be a result of going to bed too late or in too light a room where you're not getting a deep enough, dark enough sleep, or watching TV till all hours of the night and not getting your full seven or eight hours of sleep. Um, too often we hit this vicious cycle where we can't sleep so we get something to help us sleep. And then in the morning we wake up and we're fatigued so we need to get provigil or something like that to wake us up and keep us awake. And a vicious cycle gets started. I think we can better address fatigue by really good sleep hygiene, by addressing the symptoms that are preventing us from getting a good night's sleep, and also actually caffeine can be very, very effective in the morning at helping you to wake up without the pharmacologic effects that are going to keep you awake and require that you get something to help you sleep at night. The point is stopping the caffeine at a certain point so it doesn't keep you up during the night. Can I add to that? Yes. Um, one thing that I can add to that is I've, I've written actually a lot about this and discussed a, a lot about this with my patients. Um, and I, I call it the fallacy of the MS holiday. And the MS holiday, in my opinion, is a day that you wake up and you feel strong and you feel energized and your symptoms don't seem to be impacting you that much and you feel like, oh, wow, I, I can do these things that I haven't been able to do for a while, so I'm going to do them. And you go hog crazy and you just do all of these things and when I say to them maybe you shouldn't do all of those things in one day maybe you can just kind of take it easy um, dole out some of the things and I'm called a party pooper at that point but what happens is when when that happens when you have one of those days that understandably you want to take advantage of because you don't know when you're going to have another day like that the next day, you're probably going to crash. Um, and that also is fatigue. That is your body basically saying, you've overdone it. And it is suffering as a result of you having overdone it. Um, so 
one way to manage your fatigue in that situation, and again, I know it probably isn't something you want to do, is to find out what your limits are. And maybe not do everything. Maybe do some of it. And do some of it in, in increments. And you might take longer to get done what you'd like to get done, but you might then not impact your body in such a way where you're so fatigued that you collapse the next day. I just want to add a few other things. Uh, your fatigue can also be affected by your diet. Uh, we now know our, our microbiome affects the way that we function. Eating proper food helps. Uh, the other thing that also helps with fatigue, and it's counterintuitive, is exercise. When people exercise, different growth factors are stimulated in the brain. Uh, other endorphins and enkephalins are stimulated. And that actually helps to uh, reduce the fatigue. But you, you've got to exercise a number of times a week. So proper eating, weight loss. A lot of MS patients are heavy because they don't have proper diet. And if you're heavier, it's going to take more energy to move your body around. So that's also a cause of fatigue. So if you could get your weight down, keep your diet regulated, and do exercise, these are all things associated with proper sleep hygiene uh, that can help reduce fatigue. Now, I have patients where they do all of the above, and they're still fatigued, and they just can't work, or they can't do other things. And these are patients who will benefit from ProVigil, NuVigil, and in some instances, Adderall. I find that when my t fatigue gets unbearable, um, I call it knuckle-dragging fatigue and the starch having gone out of my spine. Um, that's a cue to me that I probably do have a UTI. I don't know when I have a UTI. I've never had traditional UTI symptoms, but um, I've, I've had some whoppers. So, Again, you know, it could well be that you're not hydrated, you're not sleeping well, or that there could be something underlying like an infection. So check your temperature, know what your normal body temperature is, and if there's a fluctuation of more than a couple of degrees, um, that's a cue to you right there. Thank you. We only have time for three more questions, and I already have the three selected out there, so um, then we're going to be finished here because it is getting late. And by the way, I manage my fatigue flying. <laughs> getting from one location to the next. I'm in the air. I don't have anything else to do. Thank you. This isn't a comment about my current neurologist because I think he's great, but I've been to several neurologists, but um, it's about what Dr. Lewis was talking about, how patients are resistant to share when, or embarrassed to share some of their mental depression, anxiety. And I'm just curious why physicians, all physicians, not just neurologists, um, internists, why that's not part of um, what are, you know, the questions they ask you when you go to an office visit or when they give you bad news about a diagnosis or put you on a new medication, they don't say to you at the next visit, how are you feeling? You know, it's up to you to know that you, there's a mental problem going on and you have to ask them. Why aren't physicians trained to ask patients on a regular basis, you know, um, how are you feeling? Do you have mood swings? Have you been more sad lately? I don't know that they're not trained. Um, I, I think that doctors these days are trained in many more areas than they have before. But as I mentioned, and this might be one of the reasons, that your doctor's appointment, because of managed care, is expedited, and therefore things are left out. And your neurologist is probably more focused on asking you about your reaction to your medication, doing a neurological exam, which takes time, and finding out what physical symptoms you're having. And that is unfortunate because it is, they are very important questions to ask. So my suggestion in that situation is if you're not comfortable talking to your doctor about it, seek out the nurse or seek out the social worker in your MS care center um, or try to find a therapist to talk to. I know none of these are easy things to do, but 
if you're finding that your doctor is lacking and asking you questions in those areas and it's hard for you to bring it up on your own, there might be someone else on the team who you'd be more comfortable addressing these things with. Just to go back to the issue with vitamin D, um, we know the importance of it. Um, I find it fascinating that it's not on a typical blood panel when you go to the doctor for a typical exam. They, they do not put vitamin D onto that blood panel. That's Even certainly it, something you can ask for. Um, they, they charge more, and insurance does not cover it always. Um, mine is covered not for multiple sclerosis. They found a diagnostic code that covers it, so oh, that's interesting. it's a vitamin D deficiency. Because even my children have to pay extra for it as the offspring of, of someone with MS. We code it as vitamin D deficiency. As long as you know how to code, you can get it done. So one of our diagnoses, even if I don't even know your vitamin D, so I could get your level, we'll put down vitamin D deficiency. It's just part of this stupid game. Yeah. I'm coming up to the last question, but everybody remember to fill out those seminar evaluation forms, please, and bring it to either Jane or Jill sitting in the back of the room, okay? This is actually for the, the lady that said she had ongoing uh, fatigue. Last summer, I had an episode that ran nearly a month. I consulted with my neurologist who said, stay out of the heat, stay in an air-conditioned environment. And I went to teach one of my classes on a Friday morning and collapsed on the table. I had bradycardia. It had, I was sleeping 16, 17, 18 hours a day. I managed to make it to that class because my student woke me up because I was late. And um, I collapsed on the table, and when I went to the hospital, they hooked up a halter, and I was going down to 35. So it wasn't neurological. Be careful. It, it isn't always based on the MS. Thank you. Okay, I think we're finished. Did everybody have a good time? Yeah. Let's thank those that are up there presenting to us tonight. Thank you, everybody. And everybody drive home carefully. I hear it's a little wet out there. <laughs>